How can these two things both be true at the same time? On one hand, enrollment in history majors has slid farther and faster than most any other humanities discipline. On the other hand, popular engagement with history through podcasts and documentaries and so on is thriving. What's going on, particularly in a time that desperately needs reliable historical knowledge? Let's ask. Thabit A.J. Abdullah, Chair of the History Department at York University. Christopher Dummett, Associate Professor of History at Trent University's School for the Study of Canada, and Ian Milligan, Associate Professor in the Department of History at the University of Waterloo. And we are delighted to welcome everybody to TVO tonight. And let me be just a little bit preferential. You especially, if I may say. You used to be on this program a lot back in the day mm -hmm. in Studio Two a long time ago, yeah. and we haven't had you here in a while, and it's great to see you again. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. So with that, I'm going to put you to work right away here, because earlier this year, The Economist reported that the number of students studying history in the UK declined 10% over the last decade. Mm -hmm. In the United States, it's 30%. Yeah. And we have no reason to believe things are any different here in Canada, but you're going to tell us what's happening in your department at York. Uh. There was a huge decline after the financial crisis, really. One, one can date it, actually, quite precisely. Uh, after the financial crisis, 2008, there, there was a, an incredible amount of worry about jobs and so forth and training for jobs. At the same time, the most history majors tended to go into education. And it was exactly at that same time that the uh, there was a saturation in terms of the amount of teachers that were being uh, in demand, uh, in, in, uh, especially in the Toronto area. So when I was uh, chair of undergraduate studies at uh, York, and this was before 2008, we had about 1,500 majors in our department. Mm -hmm. It was one of the largest departments in all of North America. Now we have about 500. You've lost 1,000 students. Yes, we've lost 1,000 students. And this is also true of general enrollments. Now I must say that that decline has now leveled off and is beginning to climb again, but rather slowly. What's the experience of Waterloo, Ian? <laughs> Similar, we're thinking back to the last numbers I saw, 2011, right before I showed up. We had somewhere in the, we're a smaller school than York for arts. Somewhere at 220-ish majors. Um, we hit a low in 2016 of, I want to say, high 70s, and we've sort of crawled back up to about 89 or 90. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's worse than we're seeing in, in the United States. Your situation at yeah, Trent. At Trent, uh, the numbers plummeted. I mean, I, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but I would say in my classes, and I hope it's not just me, but I don't think it is. <laughs> I know it's not just me. Uh, they, they've halved. I mean, I think the numbers have halved. Trent, uh, a lot of the students were going through teaching. When, I, when I'd, I'd ask at the beginning of the year how many people want to be teachers, three quarters of the students would put up their hands uh, in, a, in a typical Canadian history class. And now uh, you, you still get a lot of history, history or history, people who want to be teachers, but the numbers have just, just gone away. What's your theory on this, Chris? Uh, I mean, I think, you're, I think you're right that it's a bunch, it's a lot about the, the, the economy. I think that's definitely part of it. So some of it's out there, some of it is things in the economy, and some of it, it might be also what we're doing uh, uh, that maybe is wrong and maybe just isn't attracting students. I'm going to unpack that a little more a little yeah. bit later. Do, do we, Ian, not love history as much as we once did? Is that part mm. of this puzzle? I don't mm. think that's true. I think when we look at, do people like history? <laughs> They love history. They love going to historical themed movies. They like playing historically themed video games. They like listening to historically themed podcasts. They like reading historical themed books. Something happens though when they come into a university classroom in first or second year, and I don't think we excite that love of learning to make them always come back to become history majors. Now that's interesting. You're looking in the mirror for part of the explanation here. So what are you either doing or not doing that you think is contributing to this fall off? Yeah, I mean, I think what Chris was talking about, you know, we're losing the education pathway, we're losing the law pathway, um, that's fine. But I look at arts and say, we're losing majors more than other arts disciplines. Hmm. Why is that? Um, well, I think part of it is that we, sometimes when we try to sell history, they come into our classrooms and we try to say, come here for critical thinking, come here for writing skills, come here for your communication skills. And that's fine, but that doesn't really get to the core of what makes history special. Um, and the core is? To me, the core is an understanding of ambiguity, an understanding of context, the ability to take scattered, isolated data points found in an archive or a library here and weave it together into a really compelling story that fires up students, fires up audiences. What do you, when you look in the mirror, 
Yeah, what, well, it, what, what responsibility do you think the way you teach and your professors teach? Right. There's two elements to that. There's there are the objective conditions, we can say, and I'm speaking now like a historian, I guess. Uh, the financial crisis, generally the, the mood of especially North America, the focus on identity politics, etc. Um, and then there are the subjective elements of what should administrations, history departments, or even individual faculty members do. I think that this, this crisis or mini crisis could be a blessing in disguise because it could shake us a bit mm -hmm. and make us really consider how we've been dealing with uh, teaching history and attracting students. There's a number of things I think that we can do. We can, I mean, I hate to use this word, but uh, in the commercial mindset that we're all in, we can market uh, history a little bit better. We don't know the exact figures here in Canada. The Canadian Historical Association hasn't done a good study on really how well do history, uh, how well do history, uh, how well do history majors uh, do in the in the market after they uh, graduate, and they actually do very well, very well, exceptionally well. In fact, they even compete with some of the science majors in terms of. Uh, getting jobs. There's uh, rather low unemployment among uh, history majors. They tend to earn uh, good paying jobs. And it's an they excellent... They understand critical thinking. They yeah, understand dealing they with under, ambiguity. They, in fact, the American Historical Association has documented that there's a large number of employers of STEM majors mm -hmm. who lament the fact that they wish their, their employees knew a bit more about history, about liberal arts, etc. Mm. I mean, that's, that's one thing. We can market ourselves a bit better. The other thing I think is that we really need to take another look at the way we teach. Uh, and that is also rather complex. Well, it's, let's get into that yeah. here. Chris, <laughs> uh, is there something about the way you and your colleagues stand at the front of a class and teach 18, 19 year old young people that's not resonating today in a way it might have 25 or 30 years ago? Uh, so maybe, I mean, I, I'm 46, so I, I don't know really uh, anymore. But I think that, you know, this the academic specialization is a problem, right? We specialize, we come in, but that but specialization happens everywhere in every field. I think why it matters in history is that when we specialize, we tend to assume that students are gonna, are gonna be interested in the particular niches that we're interested in. And, you know, the, the essence of history is what happened. When did it happen? Mm -hmm. And we all want to talk about the why and get, 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 argue about it, you know? But students coming in at 17, 18 years old, they don't have the what and when. And we just have to focus on <laughs> what happened, when did it happen, and have some confidence that the history we're going to teach, it matters, and they need to know this. I want to follow up on that. Ian, how difficult is it to engage young people in history in the discussions of the, the whys and the hows when, for example, your typical 18-year-old doesn't know who Franklin D. Roosevelt is. <laughs> yeah, precisely. We, um, and that's been really our struggle, I think, in historical education, is that we want to develop these skills. At the same time, we have to deliver a lot of content, <laughs> as Christopher was explaining. And that's, that's, that's double the burden, I think, than many of our other disciplines who could focus on skills or could focus on content. We're trying to bring both together. So we have a real... We have a real problem in that we often tend to say, if they're not doing the readings, let's focus on the lecture experience. Let's focus on having lectures. Is that working with students when you've got all these other distractions, when you're used to more engagement? I don't think so. And so I think when I think of my own classes and other experiences we've had, the time when I see them get fired up is when we can get them to create that knowledge themselves. Mm. To go into an archive and look at some of the raw materials that an archivist has curated for them, they open up a box, they're looking at the material, and they begin to say, that explains these facts. They begin creating that knowledge themselves. That process of discovery is a real turn on. Yeah, we have to give them the context, but too much context and they don't get to do it themselves. History suddenly just becomes boring dates and people. And while they need it, if we go too far down that line, I think we also turn students away. Let me read this from The Economist from earlier this year, and that will set up the next part of our discussion here. Sheldon, if you would, bring the graphic up. Historians increasingly devote themselves to subjects other than great matters of state. The history of the marginal rather than the powerful. The poor rather than the rich. Everyday life rather than parliament. These fashions were a valuable corrective to an old school history that focused almost exclusively on the deeds of white men, particularly politicians. But, the economist says, they have gone too far. Indeed, some historians almost seem to be engaged in a race to discover the most marginalized subject imaginable. 
what were once lively new ideas have degenerated into tired orthodoxies, while vital areas of the past, such as constitutional and military affairs, are all but ignored. Thabit, you sign on to some of that? All of that? How much of that? I agree completely with completely. it. Completely. Completely I agree with it. And I think uh, that more and more my colleagues and I are recognizing this. Yes, after beginning really in, in, during the 60s, there was a real uh, innovative reaction to the great man theory of, of history. And a lot of excellent work has come out in the form of social cultural history and so forth. But I, I do agree that we have gone a bit too far, some of us anyway, and that there's a real need now to rebalance the ship. For example, I can tell you that uh, students are not just demanding, you know, nice, sexy topics, but they are demanding some of the real basic uh, uh, subjects that were the, were the stuff of the old way of teaching, of teaching history. For example, there's quite a bit of demand for military history. There's, there's demand for basic surveys of exactly what, what happened. One of, our more pop, one of our most popular courses, for example, is basically a survey of medieval Europe. You know, you'd think that would be so boring for students, but it's quite popular because, and this brings me back to the issue of teaching, the professor is excellent. You know, we have some really excellent uh, professors that attract students. They're very charismatic. They're, they present the material in, a, in a, a, a way that attracts students. And this is something that I think many history departments have undervalued. We, we put so much emphasis on research as the issue that determines promotion and so forth, not enough on teaching. I don't want to take anything away from the, the sage on the stage, right, at the, at the front of the class, but I will, I will put this forward, and I, and I want to hear your feedback on this. I got a kid I was talking to about World War II the other day, and she knew more than I thought she had any business knowing. Right. <laughs> and where did she learn it from? Playing video games. <laughs> now, I wonder how much of that you know, how much of that background is an asset to you in what you're trying to do? Uh, well, if, if, it's, if I'm teaching the history of World War II, that's fantastic, and then I can use that as a corrective, right? You can sort of say, well, what's the video game get right? What's it get wrong? That'd be incredible if you could have, I mean, I, I'm not gonna assign video games as actual homework, but, <laughs> but maybe I will. You know, I, I'm, I'm in the midst of creating a podcast, and I'm gonna use the podcast as, as kind of to, to take place in some of the lectures, and then we'll do with more interesting things in class. So that's how you build up that knowledge. She knew battles, she, she knew, knew dates, battles. and she learned it from playing a video game. Yeah. Presumably that's useful. I think it is. At because, a certain point, anyway. Because it's just the content. You know, you, you, can't, you can't correct a story that students haven't heard the first time. Mm -hmm. The uh, experience that The Economist was describing was, of course, being a British magazine, was mm -hmm. describing the British university scene. But did that resonate for you here in Ontario? It, it struck me as a little bit of a straw man. I think you can go through an academic department or you can go through the you know, proceedings of the American Historical Association or the Canadian Historical Association, and you could find some truly esoteric topics. Mm. It's a fun thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I think ultimately, when I think of all the scholarship I see, all of the books and articles that I engage with, I think at its core, even a marginalized subject, when done well, and I think most of our colleagues do it well, it's contextualized into a broader story. So it yeah, could be- Yeah, that's, that's the key. It has to be related then to the broader story. And sometimes I think we don't. Yes. Yeah. And I think we saw it with political mm -hmm. history. So mm -hmm. long maligned, dead white mm -hmm. man history. Mm -hmm. And then we're talking 10 years ago, the rise of a new political history of people saying, you're right, I don't just study the returns of elections and you know, the very narrow lives of a politician, but maybe I do. Or maybe I study other people and how these other constituencies were related to it. And I know, having been to a few of these meetings at the Canadian Historical Association, you know, sometimes you have to turn people away at the door. People love political history as long as it seems like a political history they can see themselves and what they're interested in studying reflected in. Hmm. You want to, I want to follow up with you on this because you wrote a review about a book about the great Canadian historian Donald Creighton, who I suspect many people watching us right now have no idea who he was. Probably not, yeah. Right? A, <laughs> no, if they did, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. But let's face it, it was a long time ago that he was doing his thing. And uh, here's what you wrote. This is from the LRC, uh, Literary Review of Canada. Canadian historians today largely do not like the idea of the nation. We do not tell national stories. You would be hard-pressed to find a Canadian historian who would go on the record today talking about progress. To read the works of contemporary historians is to live in a world where nothing gets better, only different or worse. 
Uh, okay, let's go here. Why do so many Canadian historians, in your view, not like the notion of our telling national uh, stories? So you, you're trying to get me in trouble, which is fine. I suppose I did write it. That's my job, so that's sir. That's good. That's good. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think there are there's two things there. One is politics, and then one is nationalism. Uh, uh, and by nationalism, I mean we don't like big identities. Identities that, and the nation is a big identity. It's we all share this thing in common. And because we've specialized so much, and because we specialize in ways that we're really interested in power, we're focused on smaller and smaller identities and, 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 and categories of oppression, right? So the nation seems as a problem, even though big collective identities are natural to human societies. They're not always this kind of identity, but these, these are important and they're, they're very functional. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, is that, you know, because the, because the, the academic professions in the humanities, social science, and history is one of them, are so skewed to, to, to the left now, vastly more than they were in the past. We don't have good Canadian data on this, but you have good American data. Mm -hmm. And the la last American data I saw, and because you can tell because who's registered as a Republican, who's registered as a Democrat. Uh, in history, at, at elite schools, it was 37 to 1, mm -hmm. re Democrat to Republican. That's how skewed it is. Is this among now, the faculty or the students or what? This is amongst the faculty. And the faculty. Now, listen, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not a Republican. If I was in the U.S., I wouldn't be a Republican. But that's a problem. And, mm. and the same thing happens in Canada. So if we're seeing the past through these politically skewed lenses, uh, we're not getting the full story. And also, we're not challenging ourselves. Like, you know, I, I, we, I, Ian and I should, should be at each other's throats in a, in a fun, rigorous, yeah. peer review kind of way. But if we all agree on the basic story, which is a political story, then we're not actually doing scholarship in a very good way. I, let me put you on the spot, Thabby. You're the head of the department. Do you yeah. see a situation where almost everybody takes a kind of left-wing approach to history and trying to teach it as opposed to a more conservative approach? I, I wouldn't say in our department that's that's a big uh, problem. Perhaps it is, you know, in the in the broader scheme of things. No, no I think in our department we have a very healthy mix of uh, various opinions, and uh, there is a healthy dialogue among among faculty members as to what's important, what's not important. But I, I do think that in general, I wish there would be a bit more of a weight given to the quality of teaching when considering hiring, when considering tenure and promotion, uh, rather than it being skewed so much in favor of only research, which is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're not that. That's interesting because I would have assumed, as a consumer of education, that the ability to teach actually would count for a, a considerable amount when you're evaluating these things. And you're saying it doesn't? Well, it does, but not to the extent <clears throat> that I think it should. Hmm. I mean, I I think that there should be more of a, a focus on that. What's your view on that, Ian? It seems obvious on the face of it, but if you want to get kids turned on to history, you need a performer at the front of that class yeah, who's going to jazz them up, mm -hmm. right? Like, just get them going. Do we have enough of that in faculty nowadays? I think the, the overall concern that people aren't hired and promoted on the basis of teaching is true. Mm -hmm. Part of that, it's really hard. What makes a good teacher? Mm -hmm. How can we objectively evaluate a teacher that's firing up students, a teacher who might be able to do more, teacher with other things in their life, taking on the hard course to teach versus the easy course to teach? Mm -hmm. It's, it's all nice and f it's good and important to explain why we need better teaching quality in universities. The question of how to assess that and how to unpack that, it's a box. So you could devote an entire show to the problem of what mm, makes a good yeah. teacher. And the answer is going to be different from everybody. And so I think partly due to that, we've gone towards assessing research. Because you can get people from other universities to assess research. You can read book reviews. You can draw on this whole broader literature than the subjective experiences of students in a class. I've always felt, though, that more, the, the more guys like you come on TV and explain how you do what you do and become, in, in some respects, personalities. I mean, you through your books and you through yeah. your teaching and your book. You were on for your, your book on the history of Iraq once upon a time. We had you on. Doesn't that just sort of raise the profile of the whole department oh, and make yeah, you guys yeah. stars in a way? And students yeah. want to... Students will, yeah. No, no, they oh, they want to learn from stars. But you'd said but, no. <laughs> no? <laughs> I, I, I thought my last book did absolutely fine, but uh, it, it did make me a star amongst my students, that's for sure. It did not? <laughs> it did not, no. I, mean, I think they liked that I did it, but they didn't hear about it outside of, uh, outside of me telling them about it. But I mm. will say, just to make a plug uh, for my university, I think some universities do actually emphasize teaching, and Trent University really does. And so there's a ways... I don't think I was a very good teacher when I started at Trent, but I think there's a way in which Trent gets into you and makes you a better teacher, and we can find ways to assess promotion 
on the basis of teaching. You can go up for research, but you can also go up for teaching, and there are ways that you can measure teaching. Yeah. How'd you get hired if you're not a very good teacher? It, it, <laughs> I didn't say I wasn't a very good teacher. I was, I'm a better teacher now. Okay. And I'm, 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 perhaps I'm still not a good teacher. I don't no, know. I but don't. You know, this, this crisis that we're discussing now has actually pushed many universities, including York, now, to really begin to take a, a very serious and strong look at the issue of teaching. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of programs about promotion, uh, uh, promoting teaching, assisting professors in with various new teaching methods, et cetera. And I think this could be one of the good things that would come out of it. Let me follow up with you on this, uh, Thabit. The, the challenge that multiculturalism poses when you're trying to teach the history of a country like Canada. Fire away. What is it? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. Uh, th that's, that, is, that is a big challenge. And at York, of all places that I've seen, I've never seen a more multicultural uh, student body than at, at York. Mm -hmm. uh, it creates uh, very interesting demands on us. For example, demands on the study of the various regions that people come from. Uh, that the students come from. They're, they're, for example, at, at York, there's a very large uh, percentage of the student body that comes from uh, South Asia. And there's a lot of demand now that I, I see from students to offer more courses on the history of India and uh, the conflict with Pakistan and all of this, uh, and how it would reflect on their immigrant experience in Canada. So the, the, the challenge is to actually provide diverse sense of, of uh, subjects without losing a, a, the focus. And the focus at York has been a really strong program in Canadian history, and this is where Ian did his uh, <laughs> PhD from, so he's, yes. he's one of ours. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're going to brag about him on definitely, television. Yeah, yeah. The fact that he's not teaching yeah. at York, you're going to let him get away with it. It's also a bit of a, a warning that you should be careful. <laughs> <laughs> How about you on that, Ian? The, the, the challenges posed by multiculturalism as you try to advance Canadian studies. Yeah. I mean, part of the problem is we're history, like thinking of University of Waterloo, we're very multicultural. Um, does our history department reflect that multi diversity and multiculturalism? Certainly not. Our research interests don't. What we can deliver as courses doesn't either. And so we're, we're left in a similar dilemma. Do we try to diversify our teaching abilities while also doubling down on our core sort of research, traditional research strength in Canadian history and these sorts of issues? And I think we're getting better. We're getting better at making a case to administrations, making a case to our colleagues that we need to have a history department that reflects the students that we have. If they're not coming to Canadian history, that doesn't mean we should throw our hands up and say, OK, let's keep running seminars with four students. Mm. It might mean, let's look at what students want. So I started, I've taught a course on the history of the internet. Students are really interested in the STEM school. What are the origins of the internet? Or what can a historian add to conversations about artificial intelligence? So I see us as really trying to pivot to make our history department reflect the interests of our students and, and what we can do. Hmm. How about your classroom? In, in, you're in Peterborough? Yeah. How I multicultural mean, are your classes in Peterborough? Well, my classroom is more multicultural than Peterborough, but mm -hmm. not like living in Toronto, I would say that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I think what Ian is saying is important, that you need to the other, offer these other courses, but I also think you need to have a confidence that the Canadian history is for all Canadians, regardless of where they're from. And there has to be a, yeah. an, 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 you know, an assertion that this, this really matters, that this, this stuff that happened in the past, it shapes who we are now, it shapes what your experience is now. You need to understand parliamentary institutions, where they came, came from. No, no, no matter where you're from, if you're in Canada now, this actually matters. So you have to do both of those things. We actually yeah. rely on you guys to get this right, because in the lead up to the last federal election, it became abundantly clear that even the leader of the Conservative Party had no clue what, in fact, 152 years of tradition yeah. were yeah. if the winning party, quote unquote, comes second and is still allowed to meet the House and try well, to that, stay well, on as prime minister. That's yeah. disastrous, really. That, you, that's, that's very dangerous. And I, I just want to plug in mm -hmm. uh, to what Christopher just said. Uh, one, of our, one of our most popular courses is a... A uh, half course or a, a term course on the history of Canada, and among the most interested in this are recent immigrants. Hmm. Why do you think? Mm. Well, they want to learn about their, the, this new country that they've come in to, hmm. to and, and they're extremely enthusiastic about becoming Canadian and really absorbing uh, the history of this of this country. So, the the issue of multiculturalism then is quite complex. On the, on, on the one hand, it demands that we try to diversify our courses. On the other hand, it really 
insist that we should not lose the focus. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys know Dan Carlin? Dan Carlin, well, you're about to be Mr. Podcast here. So Dan Carlin uh, does a thing called Hardcore History Podcast. And these are long, eh? Like these yeah. are four and five hour long yeah. podcasts. He started putting them out about 14 years ago. And this year he started experimenting with teaching history through virtual reality. Here's a clip of what it would be like to be a soldier 100 years ago during World War I. Sheldon, if you would. My dear little Marjorie, I've only just received your little letter which Mama sent with hers on November 19th. Do you remember that you asked me to be home for Christmas? I only wish I could. But there are many more soldiers in our battery who are more entitled to the Christmas leave than I am. So I'm afraid you will have to do without Daddy this Christmas. Santa Claus will come as usual. Daddy is as comfortable as possible. I expect even you would get tired enough to go soundly sleep in this dugout. It would be a change from your pink bedroom. Right again soon, dear. Heaps of love and kisses from your ever-loving daddy. That's, uh, that's good stuff, I think. Are you prepared for a future where virtual reality instruction is part of the whole mix? Well, right now, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, I think we need to really renew our profession from a technical point of view to get there. Mm -hmm. That said, when I, I look at a video like that and then reading about the immersive experience that people have, I imagine that like, if we had third or fourth year students who were really fired up, and part of their assignment was instead of writing a 20 page term paper, was to create something like that, the amount of historical knowledge that you'd need to create a video game or an immersive experience far outstrips trying to pull off a 20 page paper. So you'd be for that? I'd be for us, you know, instead of the final thesis, make a video game. What's 1867 and all that? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's, it's my new podcast, it'll launch in January. And it's, you know, not with virtual reality, but it's with sound, because there's someone who produces it, there can be sound effects and music, and it's an attempt to, to tell Canada's history, the stuff that I think really matters, which is the political history, responsible government that Andrew Shear got wrong. Mm. How, you know, tell this story, but tell it as a story, tell it as, a, as an outreach. You know, I, I've got tenure, I'm safe, I've written books, uh, so now I'm gonna do something that is for everyone. I, I hope other historians like it, but really it's for a broader, a broader audience. I will, be I will be downloading it right after we leave All here. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna subscribe. Do, do academics need to embrace technology in order to jazz up the next generation of students? They do, but they should do it carefully, in my opinion. Meaning I what? mean, I think, I think uh, one of the good things about all this discussion is that, again, it shakes us a bit out of our comfort zone. It reminds us that it's important for us to get out of our ivory towers, to engage with the community. Uh, to do popular history, to, to, to reach out to high schools, etc. And I think, I think historians, even in, in the past, did embrace, you know, they, we showed films, even historical movies, then we discussed how they were accurate, how they were not accurate, etc. And uh, there, there are a couple of experiments now with digital history and, and podcasting and all that. Some of it is good, some of it isn't. Uh, I think I think it is. I, I wouldn't be against uh, you know members of my department attempting this, but I would I would counsel caution, and I would I would counsel also that it's very it should be made very clear that this is not the complete picture of mm -hmm. how the study of World War One, for oh, example, should be understood. It's an entree. It's an entree. Yeah, there's much more to it I than got, just that. I got 30 seconds left here. Enough to ask you, 1867. 1812, 1939, 1776. Does anybody who graduates from university in Ontario today need to know what those numbers mean? They absolutely do, but you forgot an important one, 1849 or 1848, which is responsible government. Okay. Uh, and I, I would add to it, and you absolutely need, need, need to know these dates. I think it's just, it's a collective national experience that even if you've showed up, you know, my wife just wrote her citizenship test last week, she needs to know this. She was studying it for her citizenship test, so you absolutely need to know And this. do they know it? Uh, well, she does, because she, she, she read the manual. she was studying. Yeah. <laughs> I would add 1837 to the list, because well, that, that's, that revolt broke out six blocks north of the studio. That's where my podcast starts. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I've definitely listened to this after that. Okay, Thabit Abdullah, chair of the history department at York University. Ian Milligan teaches history at the University of Waterloo. Christopher Dummett teaches history at Trent University. And we're grateful to all three of you for coming into TVO tonight and helping us out with this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.